the pop pump. <clears throat> this is probably this is probably going to be the most serious video that I've ever made in all my time on the tube. So, yeah. Uh, I'll wait until, I'll wait until If you're there, give me a thumbs up. I gotta get comfy. Bible verse, it's a fearful to fall into the hands of God. According to Third Millennium Ministries, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Those living in covenant loyalty and faithfulness need to have no fear of God. Oh, no, gosh. You know, fam... There are so many things that I want to say. There are so many things that I want to say. And in many respects, I don't know how to say them. There are so many things for you young people that I would like to warn you about to keep you from making the same mistakes that I've made to save you a lot of pain and suffering and agony in your life. So, Hebrews 10.31, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And... That's what I've done uh, lately. I did this to myself. I did this to myself. I've been 10 days of just seeking God, uh, only having, you know, prayer warrior music on and praying God, you know, seeking God. Uh, the Holy Spirit departed from me, which is terrifying. I can understand now when Jesus was in the garden and uh, and he knew that he was going to be ripped away from God. And fam, please be respectful if you're seeing this. Please re be respectful and understand that I'm talking about eternal soul salvation. I'm talking about eternal soul salvation. This video is an admission of guilt. It's a apology. It's a whole bunch of things. It's a warning, you know, to those of you that mock God and mock all of the channels that are trying to warn you about what's coming up. See, what happens with unsaved people, unsaved people get theirs at the end, okay? And you go into a lost eternity forever with no chance, with no chance to make amends. Once this life is over for you, it's over, and uh, and you can't. Uh... Hey, Lily, I don't know if you're gonna call me sweet pops after I admit what I'm going to admit. But Hebrew says it's a fearful thing 
to fall into the hands of a living God. I got to switch my weight. My body, my body has become nothing but a torture chamber. And I give a shout out to Matt Lyons for sending me the, the TENS unit, which is, is wonderful. It's very compact and you plug a couple of cables in it and you shock the ever loving, you know what, out of your muscle and uh, it fatigues the muscle to where the point is, uh, it, it gives you this tingly warm feeling if it's adjusted right and it, it blocks the pain for a while, and it helps the muscle to learn, it helps the muscle to recover. But TENS units used to be several hundred dollars, and they used to be by, by prescription because they're very dangerous. If you, if you put a TENS unit connection across your heart, you can stop your heart or give yourself arrhythmia if you put it, you know, on your back to relieve back strain and you place it on the right nerve, you know, you can uh, give your brain a fit. So you have to be extremely careful with the TENS unit. But I used to work in a nursing home. So I'm all about that. But in any case, this video is an apology it's a follow-up to the other video. It's a warning. Like I said, Hebrews says, it's fearful to fall into the hands of the living God. Proverbs says, it's equal to M-U-R-D-E-R -E to sow seeds of discourse, discord among the brethren. And that's what, after 10 days of asking God to tell me what I've done that's put me in this in this situation. And fam, you know, I don't even know, I don't know if there's a path out of this for me. That's how serious this is. You know, I've asked God to forgive me. The Holy Spirit has like departed from me for at least two days. I don't feel the Holy Spirit like I used to. Uh, it's horrendously painful to sit in the wheelchair even for a couple of minutes. It's like I put a dead end. It's like I put a dead end right uh, in the way of my life. And uh, it's like Balaam's donkey warning Balaam when he uh, he was going to curse Israel. Now, I, don't take that the wrong way. I've not meant to curse anybody, you know, intentionally. But in my trying to exp explain how serious soul salvation is, I've stumbled into a pit. And you have to understand, you have to understand, fam, that there were people like Judas who, who lived and, and ate with Jesus and he messed up, you know. King Saul, he knew all about God and he messed up, you know. Uh, people who knew that God was serious and God was real and everything and still they made the mistakes, that's quite... That's quite scary when you think about it, that you can, that you can do what I did. And, uh, you know, the apostle Peter, God said, uh, your name is going to be Peter, the rock, and I'll build my, my uh, kingdom on the rock and the gates of hell will not prevail. And then when Christ said that he was going to be crucified, you know, the apostle was like, Lord, we're not going to let that happen. And Jesus turned to him and he said, get thee behind me, Satan. 
So he went from accolades from the Lord to chastisement. And I'm in a period of very painful, I can tell you, very painful chastisement that I brought on myself, you know? And it took a whole bunch of different things to, to click. Especially, like I said, since I don't feel the Holy Ghost right at the moment. So, in any case, in any case, am I describing people's cavalier attitude about soul salvation? I've stepped on some toes, and God has let me know about it. Believe me, he's let me know. And see, fam, if I disregarded, if I disregarded the warning from God, the next step for God is to take you out. People who are unsaved, who mock God and all, they pay for that. They pay for that at the end of their life in eternity. And there's no, there's no coming back from that. I went right to the edge, and as somebody who knows God and knows about God, I stumbled into this. I would say, I would say, use the word in my hands. I'll be that hard on myself. And fam, this is a big time serious warning for other people, you know, about don't take your salvation casually and see fam I was raised I was raised in a spiritual gutter you know my parents my parents were idolaters we had we had Bast and Ron and Nubis and Horus on the mantle of my parents house we had the mother child reunion with the candle you know and I, I don't have time to go into that, why that's wrong. We had Buddhas all in the house and in the garden. My sister was praying uh, the Namnio to a, a altar she had built up in a room. My grandmother did tarot cards. My father, my father was reading this book called Seth Speaks about channeling spirits. My mother was into Egyptology and she was trying to decipher this disc that was going to bring hidden wisdom into the world. Now, fam, I got to tell you, God is no respecter of persons. He has a level playing field. So if you're seeking hidden wisdom like Harry Potter and all of this other stuff where you need to learn an enchantment to get hidden wisdom. That's witchcraft and it's abomination. Okay? So, in any case, like everybody else who's normal, you know, uh, anybody who's normal, I have my opinions and people have their opinions, but the way I went about it was wrong. Instead of just saying my opinion, like, for example, uh, Pastor Mike Evans, he believes that the children of unsaved parents will not go in the rapture. I don't believe that at all because it's not, it's not scriptural, you know. But it took, it took the last piece of the puzzle to come from very loving people like Tyler at Generation 2434 and Tom at Watchman River. His last talk about the power of love is so powerful and affected me so profoundly and was part of my literal reclamation. Literally. So people have been praying for a physical healing for me, but 
the problem wasn't physical. The problem was a spiritual problem of arrogance, you know, of being a, a well-schooled person, but being an intellectual heathen, as uh, Pastor Charles Lawson would put it. I'm not doing the Jeff Tubin. I'm just very uncomfortable, and I'm not sure if God's going to leave me in this state in order to keep me close to him. Because, see, people who don't know the history, uh, when you get the chance, can you please pray for me? I'm having some issues now that are bringing me down. Yeah, Hungry, I'll pray for you. But you have to understand, I just told you that the Spirit has departed from me. So, you know, I'm not the best person to ask right now if my prayers are going up and hitting the ceiling and bouncing back because of my disobedience then why would you ask me to pray for you right at the moment? You know what I'm saying? And plus, it's just better if you let me if you let me roll and say what I need to say would be the better service to God right at the moment. You know, I love you, I care about you, and I will I will ask God if I'm restored to help you. But like I said, the seriousness the seriousness of what I've done and what I've stumbled into, God calls abomination. When you're at the abomination level with God, that's big time. That's one step away. Like God says, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, there's no recovery from that. So all you, all you people who mock God and everything, I will try and pray for you, okay? I will I will try. I always keep my word on that. But like I said, I'm not sure if it will have any effect because God has pulled the Holy Spirit back from me, which is terrifying. It's stone terrifying. It's like being in hell right now while you're still alive. I can tell you, my hands just burn, my hands burn from this feeling, you know? And like I said, fam, you know, God may forgive me of it. He may forgive me of it. He may decide like he did with Paul where he said, my grace is sufficient for you. And see, people don't know history now. That's why they don't understand like the picture of Jesus with the sheep on his shoulder back in Bible days when they had a sheep would run off and the the shepherd had to keep chasing after this one sheep what he would do eventually if the sheep was a knucklehead he would take his staff and he would whack the leg of the sheep and the sheep would be lame and it couldn't walk, and it couldn't provide for itself. So after a couple, you know, the sheep would snap at the shepherd for hurting it, but then it would get the understanding that the shepherd is its only provision, and if it wants to survive, it needs to get with the program and cooperate with the good shepherd. So the shepherd would put that sheep around its shoulders and carry it along with the rest of the herd while the sheep's leg would heal. And then when he finally put the sheep down, the sheep was so grateful that it wouldn't run away anymore. Okay? Now, beyond that, beyond that, the Lord says he's made a way of salvation for us. And if we know him and know about the way, and we... We still, you know, we still run off. Then God says there's no more solution for you. That's the danger for people who get born again 
and backslide uh, go into. Now, on other channels, on other channels, they they equate backsliding with only having a little bit of the light. That's not scriptural at all. When when the Lord was talking about people who don't have, who only have a little bit of light, those are people that are in in uh, remote places that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. But morality is inherent in what's put in the original man so that you go to a tribe where they got a plate in their mouth and a, a boars ring in their nose. They still know that M-U-R-D-E-R is wrong and stealing is wrong. And in their tribes, they have punishment and they have a a legal system. You know, even though it might be a little bit crude, you know, like burying people alive who, who offend the tribe, that kind of deal. So when I, when I go to warn people about this, you know, you have to find a way to do it in a loving, in a loving way, you know, so that you don't drive people off. And the other thing, fam, if you're going to, if you're going to tell somebody about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's, it intimates in the Bible, intimates now, that if you've heard the, the gospel of Jesus and you reject it, and you go into the tribulation period having already heard and rejected the gospel, there's very little chance of you getting saved because God will send a strong delusion of deception during the uh, tribulation period. In the book of Isaiah, it says the blacksmith has been formed in order to fan the coals of destruction. Now, the blacksmith, it intimates that that the devil has been given enough power in order to destroy people who, who are not God's protection. And blacksmith used to have this bellows, and they would pump it, and it would blow onto the coals and make the coals red hot, but it would also consume the fire would consume more quickly. So my point being is there's no being on the fence with Jesus Christ. It's like if you decide not you're not going to pay your electric bill, you're going to come home someday in the dark. So fam, like I said, I take this stuff very seriously. And I want you to take it very seriously. And see, the thing I disagree with, even though I'm in a period of punishment, I still disagree with people that say that backsliders are automatically going to go in the rapture. And, uh, and I'm more on the side of John MacArthur, Vody Bachman, uh, Paul Washer, Charles Lawson, you know, and uh, I have to switch my weight. It makes me so sad. It makes me so sad that we're talking about eternal soul salvation. And somebody will get in the comments and type something nutty because they're not taking it, they're not taking it seriously. And I, I can either hope that you're a young child. I uh I can either hope that you're a young child or uh a very immature adult that I just had to put in time out and see these these people now living with your parents till you're 30 and 40 years old 
burdening your parents living in their basement. I was independent from eight years old on. I, uh, I earned money from eight years old on. I went to work full time for $9 a day when I was 14. At 15, my father put me out of the house because I was getting bulky working in gas stations and gar working on garbage trucks. And my father was afraid that I would retaliate for all of the crappy, evil things he was doing to me. And he got saved. And I had the privilege of being, being at his bedside uh, while he passed. I got to take a sip. But fam, the point I want to make here is that you don't want to take your soul salvation lightly. And I feel I'm not sowing discord on purpose, but I feel that brethren that are telling you, you know, not to sweat it, you know, and that people like me are being legalistic when they tell you to seek, uh, seek living a life where the Holy Spirit of God can indwell you. You have to have the Holy Spirit of God to be raptured. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no rapture for you. So what I'm saying right in my current condition it's very possible I could be left behind uh, for the tribulation. And see, I would still have the, the same eternal destiny as long as I refuse the mark of the beast and uh, let myself be martyred during the tribulation. That's why it's so fearful for me not to feel the move of the Holy Spirit. And fam, when you get born again and filled with the Spirit of God, you'll know it because you will be able to work powerfully on God's behalf. You'll be productive. You will love the things of God. And you'll be disgusted when you sin. And you'll be disgusted when at other things that you used to uh, like worldly sin. It's not, it's not falling on the ground and saying palabra jabber, jibby jabber, who stole my Honda and untie my bow tie and all that stuff and writhing around and laughing like you're out of your mind. That's what's called a Kundalini spirit. It's not the spirit of the one true and living God, okay? And when people, when the apostles talked in tongues that day in the Bible, they talked in literal different languages so that the whole crowd could understand. It wasn't palabra jabber, jimmy jabber, and then somebody in a pink uh, zoot suit Sands up and says, thus says the Lord, rainbows and unicorns and, and all of that other stuff. No. Example, if I went into a church and uh, the pastor was talking in French and he's at the altar, he's saying, il est très bien, mon père, il est très bien. And I tapped the guy next to me, I said, I'm sorry, I don't speak that language. What did the pastor just say? And the, the guy would lean over and he would say, the pastor said, you're very good, my Lord. You're very good. That is, that is interpretation of tongues. It's not where somebody says palabra jabber, jibby jabber, 
and then somebody interprets tongues, and then they say, well, the Lord said for us to run outside of the church and lie down and eat grass like cows. No. That's confusion. That's of the devil. And I'm very sorry to you people. Now, there are people that go to these big meetings and they get saved and born again, filled with the Spirit, but it's because of the true believers that go there for the music and the and the Spirit of God. The true believers are the ones that are there. But the problem with going to a meeting like that is when you go to a meeting where error is preached, fewer and fewer people will be saved and more and more error will be spread about, i.e. Uh, hoops that people have to jump through in order to be saved and all. Like the Book of Mormon and the and the Mass Book and and other books of of what's your name Eddie and all that other stuff that are in addition to <coughs> it says that the warning in Revelation says that those people who take away from uh, the word of God will be taken away from the tree of life. You know, their place among the tree of life will be taken away. And those people that add to the word will add things, you know, to their life that they're not going to want. Believe me, they're not going to want the, the uh, punishments and chastisements that are coming their way for leading people astray. That's why, fam, I take it very seriously. I take it very seriously. And when you get born again, you're supposed to be a watchman because it says, it says that if the sword comes and people are destroyed because you haven't told them, then those people, their blood is on your head. But if you've told them the true word of the living God, a very simple message, a simple message of God's grace and your repentance equals born again. And repentance is being sorry, but it's also, it's also actively turning from what you did that displeased God. It's not saying a few words and running down into mommy and daddy's basement and playing Grand Theft Auto, kicking hookers out of cars or watching pornography. If you're still doing that, then, then uh, you've not repented. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And you are trading your eternal soul salvation for a uh, convenience and enjoyment at the cost of your soul salvation, very probably. So I'm just going to tell you. And you don't, you don't keep that thing in your house, you know, in order to pass the test of being, temptate, being tempted. You take that game station and you don't sell it to somebody else. You bust it up and throw it in the trash so that the devil can't use that thing to destroy some other family. And you all know what I'm talking about. Mommy and daddy will call you for dinner and you're like, wait a minute, I'm I'm almost at the high score on this very important game and nobody's gotten this high score. Wait a minute, quit bothering me. And then you run upstairs and you begrudgingly eat the dinner that mommy and daddy slaved over for you to enjoy. You don't say thank you to God. You don't, uh, you know, say thank you for them putting a roof over your head. You don't say thank you for the people that slaved out in the fields to grow the food for you. And then you run downstairs and you grab the controller away from your little sister and push her on the floor. And she starts screaming and crying. And all of this discord is sown in your family because you had to get the next high score 
on some ridiculous, worthless game that is just smoke and mirrors from the devil. The, the assistant to Klaus Schwab of the WEF, he said, he said that entertainment and D-R-U-G-S were purposefully pumped into the population to keep them busy and keep them occupied while they're doing their evil stuff that they're doing. So fam, I asked God today to have mercy on, on me to bring you this message of uh, admitting I had gone right to the edge and thankfully God has pulled me back. Now, like I said, fam, if I continued, if I continue, had a, I continued in this way, I can tell you God would have shut me down and cut me off for good. The thing that I'm praying for with God now is restoration, a prayer of restoration, and to move to the next level of where I can still be a service to God, but not injure other people with my words, my actions, my deeds. You know, and like I said, Tom at Watchman River, uh, I wasn't raised in a loving family. When my when my son got run over by when my son got run over by our own car, I was at my mother and father's. They never said we're sorry for you. They never rubbed my back, you know, and tried to comfort me. They didn't even say, well, you might want to go upstairs and spend the night in your in your old room rather than driving an hour and a half back home after you just found out that your son has been run over by your girlfriend's car. You know, that was a big pill to swallow at the age of 17, I can tell you, that was a big, big, uh, and see other people later on in life tried to explain to me about what love is, real love, uh, love without sex or, or, or love without uh, a price tag on it, you know? When I went to work for Mr. Sam, his mother uh, called me into the office. Come here, boy, and give me a hug. And she would hug me, and I would just be there like a dead fish. I didn't know how to return uh, love in a godly way, you know? When I was, when I was young, at a very early age... Uh, love was just hopping in bed with somebody. Just hopping in bed and, and you know, doing the do and, and see you later. Me being me, you being you, that kind of thing. I had a lot of bad influences. I had a lot of bad influences coming up, and I had some good ones. And God reached into that mess and snatched me out of it. And it makes me sad. It makes me sad that I may have stepped on some toes and hurt some feelings inadvertently. And... uh and uh, interfered with some people's uh, interfered with some people's 
a journey, you know, and I can tell you, fam, if I was on a, a desert island stranded, I would want a large print King James Bible, Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, and that little new King, King, new King James book of God's uh, Book of Promises that Tom has shown on his channel. So, Tom did a good work, did a good work in my life. And, uh, see, people like that, who are very loving and all of that, to me, to me, that always raised a flag of suspicion, to be quite honest, because I had been hurt, but I've been hurt and used by so many people who said that they loved me, you know. And, and people who said they loved the Lord. My the minister, my sister, the minister, who went to, to school and is an accredited minister. Uh, now, I have to be very careful with my words in this part of what I'm going to tell you not to fall right back into the trap, you know, of sowing discord among the brethren. But my sister, the minister, went and lived with my father after my mother passed, and she endured 10 years of hell on earth with my father, who wasn't born again at the time. And they actually lost, her husband lost a rank in the military because they were supposed to go to Europe. And they came back to look, at, look after my father. So my brother-in-law retired early and it cost him a whole, it cost him a whole rank in the uh, military by retiring early. It cost him rank and prestige and money. And you figure he gave up his, he gave up his plans for what he wanted to achieve all for my father to see father's house like he wanted to. That's a very big cost. But by the same token, when my father, when my father went into the hospital, his aorta burst, which is very common among lifetime smokers. Hey, alligator. So his aorta burst and he went into the hospital. I didn't know enough about the word of God to have prayed for my father. My father for his last three years was my best pal and confidant and buddy. And had I known now what I had I known then what I know now, I would have laid hands on my fast for his healing rather than the awful way that my father slowly languished in the hospital and passed away. And there was a whole bunch of dynamics going on. The family was worried about my father living long enough in the hospital to eat up their inheritance and all that other money, all that other stuff, and bring a big expense on the family that wouldn't be covered. And so when my father went into the hospital, his cats went through the house. Meow, meow, meow. You know, where are you at? Looking for my dad. And it was driving my sister, my sister crazy. So rather than uh, and take the cats to the pound or 
have them put with another loving family. My sisters took the cats to the vet and shame on him for doing it and had both healthy young cats put to sleep so they wouldn't suffer. But see, in doing that, let's say my father had recovered from the hospital as an elderly person and come back home to find that his cats had been M-U-R-D-E-R-D, you know, that would have wiped him out right there. So essentially, my, my sister was saying, well, there's no return home for my father back from the hospital, you know. And so when people like that act lovey-dovey with me, I always think about stuff like that in real terms. You know, what happens if I become inconvenient? And my other sister said one time, she said, Will, you know, when you pass away, I'm going to have you cremated and put in a little box, and I'm going to hold you while they put me in the casket and bury us both in the ground. And I was like, no, you're not. I was like, we don't get along now. Why do you think I want to be cremated and put in some little box and put next to you and be buried six feet under forever? No, thank you. So they wanted me to come and live with them. They wanted me to come and live with them. And I had been on the street. I was living in a Dodge dealership. And uh, the shop foreman was turning his head while I was camping out at the Dodge dealership, which was a uh, ruin because... Obama had uh, saved the U.S. auto industry, but he consolidated Dodge, Chrysler, Plymouth, and Jeep all into one lump sum, you know, so that a car trailer would go down the street full instead of having one Dodge or one Jeep or one Plymouth on the, on the truck. That didn't make any sense. So all the dealerships in my area closed, except for the Chrysler dealership. And he had to pay like another 60000 bucks to buy back the franchise. And he had to have his little garage dealership made into a very grand, you know, two-story foyer and all that in order to qualify. You know, things that my dealership wasn't... Uh, able to do, willing to do. So I'm homeless, living at this dive ship, and I, I got the idea to buy a hat with a big old silver security notice on the front of the hat. Uh, one of those duckbill hats that said security, so that anybody who came by the Dodge dealership at 12 midnight and saw me camping out at the Dodge dealership would say, well, naturally, that's the security guard. So that's how I managed that. So my family said to come up for a visit around Christmas time. They got this enormous, like 5,000 square foot mini mansion up in the hills and it was relatively affordable at the time. You know, they got a good deal on it, paid cash for it. They got five Christmas trees in the house. And they invite me for dinner. Now, they got a basement. They got a basement where I could have stayed in the heat and the warmth of the basement. And I could have been my sister's sound manager, as she promised me, for her international ministry would have been a good asset to their ministry, except being the black sheep of the family that wasn't even allowed by my mother when my mother was getting ready to pass away because that would upset her. I hadn't done anything major wrong, you know, 
Back then, I was a little bit of a fighter and a drinker and a scrapper because, you know, I was working young, young boy working among these garbage men that were rough and they were leather necks and all of that other stuff. It was very difficult environment. I don't have time to go into that. So I go and I visit my sister and they, they have dinner with these gold rim plates. And I'm like, you know, it's uncomfortable because if I'm nervous and drink a coffee cup on the plate and chip it, I'll be marked for life. So I'm having a very uncomfortable dinner. And they're saying, well, Will, now that you're left-handed after the accident, you have to sit at the top of the table where my husband normally should sit so that you don't elbow all of us right-handed people who are trying to enjoy our dinner, being as you've got to go against the flow. And I'm very nervously eating my dinner. And so I ate the first thing that I enjoyed, which was the macaroni and cheese, which was quite good. And after the accident, I had lost uh, feeling and function on the right side of my face and my throat. So eating the roast beef was very uh, dangerous and nerving to me. I wasn't making conversation like I used to. And they were all wondering about that. And then they said, well, don't you enjoy your Brussels sprouts because you ate your mac and cheese and you're picking at your meat and you left your Brussels sprouts. And oh, by the way, isn't that how brother-in-law Danny eats his food? He eats all of one thing instead of eating around his plate. And isn't that weird and creepy? Now, all these comments while I'm sitting there trying to mind my own business and survive dinner. And so dinner's over. We go into the living room. I apologize for not having gifts for everybody being homeless. I really didn't want to go, and I shouldn't have gone. And my sister and brother-in-law, who, by the way, are millionaires, give me this little camper's blanket, which is 40 inches by 60. It's what's called a throw blanket in this little paper wrapper. And I thank them profusely. And I go back to the car dealership to sleep concrete floor and I put the blanket down around my feet and it comes up to about here on my chest so I get cold up around my chest and arms so I pull the blanket up to my chest and arms and now my feet are uncovered and it's this whole night of pulling the blanket back and forth and back and forth in the freezing cold car dealership with all of the heat and everything turned off. So a tractor trailer pulls up to spend the night in the parking lot. And I, I walk out to the tractor with my security hat and ask the guy what's up. And he, he said, uh, he said, Oh, is it okay for me to park here overnight? And I said, I said, sure. Before the boss comes in the morning, they feel that the weight of the tractor trailers is tearing up the asphalt in the parking lot. And I told him, I said, I'll make a deal with you. You let me uh, sit up in the warm cab because I'm in the cold dealership. I said, you let me sit up in the warm cab and we'll call it even. So the guy like freaked out. He thought that he acted like I was asking to sleep in the in the sleeper cab with him or something. You know, and he was like, and rolled the window up and pulled off. 
you know, pulled off. And that was that. And I went back into the car dealership to lie on the cold concrete floor with my little camper blanket. And God was God was good during the hard times. And uh, I never got sick. Never caught cold or anything. And the manager at the time of uh, Vernon would, uh, I would sit at my desk and I would just think to myself, Lord, I wish I could have Quiznos. I wish I could have a nice Quiznos sub and some chips and a Coke or a Pepsi. And in the door, in through the door comes Vernon with two Quiznos subs, large bag of chips and a liter bottle of Coca-Cola. And man, I was ate my fingers off. I was so hungry. But conversely, the owner of the dealership, <clears throat> who is married, had an affair with two different women. <clears throat> and for you women, if you're dating a married man and he's telling you he's going to leave his wife someday, don't count on it. Find somebody else should be used because the girl at the dealership who did the paperwork was, uh, was, you know, doing a little something, something on the side with the boss. And she's thinking it's going to get her somewhere. And when the dealership got closed, he just told her he didn't need her anymore. And she came in with a cardboard box to get her stuff out of her desk. And she passed by his desk and she said, you so-and-so. He's like, eh, you know, toss. That's the way people are, uh, are nowadays, fam. So don't put yourself in a position like that. And wind up as one of those girls having to go to a clinic and have her baby scraped out like seeds out of a pumpkin. Because that guy who told you, I'm your man, and we don't have to use protection. I'll always be there for you. And then once you're pregnant, he says, well, you got to go handle your business. You know? So, fam... What I'm telling you overall is don't be cavalier. Don't, don't assume. Don't assume your soul salvation just because somebody said something that tickled your ears. You know, people nowadays, that's why the church is so weak. We go through God's cafeteria and we take a little bit of love and we take a little bit of of uh, prosperity, but we don't want the trials and we don't want the hardships that come with life. You know, we don't want the responsibilities. That's a, oh, the responsibilities, that's like Brussels sprouts. Ooh, yuck. You know, you don't want that. You want all of the good things, but you don't want the responsibility and the bad things. That's why. That's why you got 30 and 40 year olds who don't believe in God or his goodness and they're afraid deep down to go out into the world and they're camping out in mommy and daddy's basement until mommy and daddy have to get a lawyer and have them uh, taken out of the house and then they have to move and lock the house up and move to a different address to get rid of you. You don't want to be like that. I've worked since I was 14. Full-time job, $9 a day. Not $9 an hour, $9 a day. And back then, there were men that were raising families on that kind of money. And uh, my father pushed me out when I was 15. And then they locked the door of the house. They went out of the country because they cared so much for me. 
And I made the biggest mistake of my life of not going next door and knocking on the neighbor's door who loved me like a son and asking if I could rent her basement because I had the money. In an abusive situation, I always stacked the cash so that uh, if things got bad with my father trying to put a cigarette out on me or punch me down the basement stairs, you know, have a nice trip, see you next fall, that kind of deal. I could have stayed with the very nice lady next door. I could have finished college, become the doctor I wanted to be. Totally different life instead of working on a garbage truck, growing up around hookers and drug addicts and bisexuals who thought thought that a Lenderoni 15-year-old boy was just as good as a girl, you know. I'm just telling you the way it is. And so in this period of chastisement, you know, and it, fam, it, it has taken me like 10 days of asking God over and over, what have I done? What have I done? And turning off the TV and just having quiet music until I finally got the answer. I'm not there yet. Body still hurts like a, a prison cage, you know, and I don't feel the Holy Spirit. I'll have to, I'll have to ask God, you know, uh, what to do in order to get cleansed and get the Holy Spirit, you know, residing in me. And fam, those of you that say when you mess up and you only have a little bit of the light, that's not scriptural at all. Having a little bit of the light of the gospel of truth <coughs> versus backsliding, <coughs> which is having, <coughs> having known the truth of God and deciding that you're going to blow it off and go your own way, that's two totally different things, fam. One is not the other. And again, even at the peril of saying that I'm sowing discord, those people that are telling you that are, are, are incorrect, whether they, they know it or not, okay? They're incorrect. And you want to be a Berean Christian. Hey, what's up, Candy? Thank you, I appreciate that praying the best for me. You want to be a Berean Christian where you hear the word, you gratefully accept it with joy, and then you get in your Bible and you look up and you you find out not that the person's, you know, lying to you or being untrue, but whether it's correct or not, in a spirit of love, like Tom, like Tom says. And see, that's a predicament is to find out more about how to be loving when I was never around loving. You know, I, uh, I was raised in a, a very verbally and physically abusive environment with idolatry. My parents weren't lovey-dovey. I didn't call them mom and dad. I called, I called my mother Alice or son. I say, hey, son. Or uh, and it wasn't disrespect. I never called my parents the old man and the old lady. My parents had nicknames for their parents, so I called my mom Alice. I called my father Buck, you know. And my father got saved when he was seventy-seven, which is very unusual to get born again that late. And I would take him out to lunch, put him in my Lincoln, take him to lunch, go around, open the door for him, and, you know, help him into the restaurant. And I would think to myself, I used to be so scared of this man because when he would beat you, he would do this car wash of taking the belt from the head 
and just working it down. And he wasn't happy until you had a certain amount of screaming and crying and begging for him to stop, you know. It wasn't many times, but believe me, it was enough. It was enough. Mother, my mother beat me one time all the way to a neighbor's house because the neighbor's kid left a baseball bat on our uh, lawn. And I told the parents that somebody had given it to me. My mother beat me all the way up to the lady's house. She said, I'm so ashamed of you. She beat me with every syllable. And she was an overweight, sickly woman. So that wasn't good either. But uh, I would take my father to uh, the Thunderbird, which had wonderful Polynesian food. And he would say, how are you doing, son? And I would say, good, dad, good. How are you? Oh, fine, son, fine. And the whole conversation was good, good, fine, fine. He'd call my sister up. Will and I talked about everything, you know. And I had the privilege to be with him as he was passing, telling him I loved him and it was going to be okay. And see, that was very difficult because I had reconciled back then of all of the things that he had done to me, that was by God's grace that I was able to be at his bedside telling him I loved him, which I do dearly. I've seen him in heaven. He's got raven black hair. He's handsome, again, young, friendly, you know. I almost didn't recognize him, to tell you the truth. And I told him, I said, Pop, it's not going to hurt. You're going to feel little bit of tingling, and then you're going to be with Jesus, and I'm going to be right behind you. And right at that point, he stopped. And something, some thousands of, of something came through the window and through me, and they got Buck. And then they came, and in one split second, we were all together, my father, my soul, thousands, thousands of others, and they went out the window, and I called my relatives, and I said, 1138, Buck passed, and they didn't say, well, Will, we're so sorry for you, thank you for, thank you for being there with him, you know, by the way, the house is just two blocks from the hospital, you know, would you like to come and stay in your old room, it's not a good idea, for you to drive, none of that. It was just thank you, click. And so I popped open the can of Coke, opened up the the package of cheese nips, which was my dinner, you know, and uh, it was horrific watching Buck turn purple and the life support machine was still like Darth Vader going, And my family at the hospital, when they had the meeting, when they uh, when they put a do not revive on him, the man who had who had intubated him looked at my whole family, and he took the hose that was going to my father, and he bent it and cut the air off for a second, and the machine went blen 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 blen. And he looked at the family like, don't any of you get any ideas to accidentally step on his air hose or unplug the machine. The guy did this. I thought that was very curious. But he read my family, you know. My family was like, okay, let's go. You know. And see, I was working back then. I was working for two garbage companies and going to college. Nobody paid my college or anything. I took business administration and management. I was so tired, I had to have a tape recorder where I could tape the professor and then listen to it in the garbage truck, bouncing around. 
and I would get back home and then get back up 2.30 in the morning to do it all again. And one morning, I went to the uh, Connecticut Avenue building on East West Highway on the corner, and I pulled up to the dumpster, and I fell asleep. And I woke up with my head on the steering wheel with the truck hooked up to the dumpster and I looked into the mirrors and there were thousands of cars parked around the truck. Thousands of cars parked around the truck. And I had to go inside and I said to the information desk, I said, if you can't help me, I will be fired. I said, please make an announcement for people to come out and move their cars so I can back the truck out on the East West Highway and keep my job. And one person would come out and move their car and they'd give me a dirty look and I'd back the truck up a little. Then another person and another. It took me an hour and 20 minutes to get out of the parking lot and then to finish my route, you know, hurry hurry up and finish the route, so that my boss would not fire me. And believe me, fam, he was a patient man because I had just uh, knocked down Norris Brothers Amico in Rockville with the truck. I knocked down Norris Brothers Amico accidentally with the truck, went uh, through the Amico and flattened it. And they... Uh, decided not to rebuild it so Rockville Medical is there uh, I went to I went to Roy Rogers in Bethesda and I had just picked up Duran paints and there was this beautiful 1964 Lincoln Continental block long Lincoln Continental uh next to the dumpster. So I dumped the dumpster and it didn't occur to me, get away from the car before you pack the truck. So I dumped the dumpster like a robot, put the dumpster down, packed the truck, and all of this blue and white and pink and red paint squirted all out of the truck onto the Lincoln Continental. So there was this uh, black Lincoln Continental that had all this, this hippie object art all over it. So I got the bright idea. I got the bright idea to take a dumpster sticker out from behind the seat and try and wipe the paint off the Lincoln Continental. So uh, I got out of the truck and I was Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Wiping the roof and the and the side windows and the side of the Lincoln Continental. And the paint firmed up and the sign stuck to the side of the Lincoln Continental. And so here was this beautiful, I'm sure the person came out, you know, from the left side of the car, looked beautiful. And then they wondered why the windows were smushed and they went around the side and they went around the side and the whole side of the car was pink and blue and red and white paint with a blue ribbon refuse sticker stuck to the side of the Lincoln Continental. So there was no doubt as to what happened or who had caused it, you know. So again, I got on the radio, Mr. McMurray, you'll never guess what happened. You never guess what happened. And the poor man had cancer. And I'm sure that having me work for him kind of moved his cancer along more quickly. I'm sure of that. After I knocked the uh, uh, gas down. But I was careful. It's just that the equipment was crappy and worn out and dangerous. And, uh, we were forced to, to use it, you know. And my boss one time, he said, Will, he said, he said, my God, 
you've uh, you hit everything except the lottery, telephone poles and gutters and mailboxes. And he said, you hit everything except the lottery. And I told him, I said, and boss, one day I'm going to hit that too. Because I picked up, uh, I picked up Shakey's Pizza in Bethesda on this real nasty little alley uphill. And it was off of East West Highway, very dangerous stop. You know, sh most companies wouldn't even want the stop. So I go up the alley in the garbage truck and I hook up to the dumpster and I lift it up and I hear pop swee. So I lift up the dumpster a little bit more. I hear pop swee. So I decide to put the dumpster down and back up and go, hey, how are you doing? And go actually do my due diligence and look around the dumpster. And wouldn't you know it, this employee at Shakey's Pizza had chained their bicycle to the fence and to the dumpster. So when I took, picked the dumpster up, it tore their bicycle in half. I appreciate that. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Any case, getting back to cases uh, about soul salvation, because I got to go in a few minutes, take my nightly medicine. Uh, people who are born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, are going to go in what's called the rapture. That's when Jesus comes for his bride and the bride of Christ gets caught up for seven years at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So that right, that right there is proof during the tribulation period that the rapture is pre-tribulation. Marriage supper of the Lamb, seven years. Tribulation, seven years. <clears throat> now for those of you that don't take things seriously, and for whatever reason, me not being the judge, you get left behind. That's between you and God. See, I'm improving already in how I delivered the message. That's between you and God. I'm not the judge. If you get left behind, two choices. You take the mark of the beast so that you can eat, and then you go to hell, or... Second choice is you refuse the mark of the beast and you get martyred by the one world system, which I believe is going to be Islam because that's a religion right now that beheads people. And see, the Christians are going to, Christians are going to be taken. Islam is going to be the world religion. Sharia law is going to be the law of the land. If you don't bow before the one world and accept Islam, you're going to get martyred. Now, your soul does not go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those at the marriage supper of the Lamb are enjoying this beautiful banquet and beautiful gowns and, and finery. You, being martyred, you get a clean white robe. Now, According to the word, check it for yourself. Your soul goes under the altar. And believe me, you're going to know what you're missing. And see, these people under the altar, they say, how long, uh, oh God, faithful and true, must we abide under the altar? And he says, just a little while longer until the fullness of the others that must be martyred is brought in. That's all of the rest of the people that are going to be martyred during the tribulation period. So that's the other choice. Third group of people are going to be those people, maybe from bunkers or, or survivalists or preppers, that make it through the seven-year tribulation. Their spirit is still lost. They're still lost. They go through the seven-year tribulation into the millennial kingdom, and being as, being as they are still mortal 
they repopulate the earth in the thousand year reign of Christ. Now their destiny is that the devil gets released at the end of the thousand years and he corrals all these people and he gets them. He does the same old thing. He accuses, he accuses the Lord of not being fair and all that other stuff and tries to corral people and get them to rebel against the one true and living God. And they all get cut down and thrown into the lake of fire. So those are the destinies, depending on the choices that you make, that await you. And like I said, you know, I know people that are atheists or they're agnostic. And that well, I don't believe all that. Most people that I know that are atheists have some sort of hurt that they can't overcome where they feel that God was unfair. My boss, when I was a boy who had cancer, we were in a parking lot. We were in a parking lot one afternoon and he looked up. Now here's a man who says he doesn't believe in God. He looks up and he says, God, you son of a... And I was like, whoa. Long story short, the cancer broke out around his nose and his face. So what they did was they put his arm here and they did a skin graft. And he spent three days with that arm up against his face in the very position that he had sworn against God. So shout out to everybody. I want to keep rolling while I'm on my thought of soul salvation. That's the most important thing. Fam, you all got to know I love you. I care about you. I hope God will be gracious to me and forgive me of this latest uh, misstep, you know, of, uh, like I said, if there's anybody out there that, that uh, I caused uh, hurt or pain to, I apologize. I apologize. And, uh, and uh, you know, I took what Tom Watchman Channel said to heart. I took what he said to heart. And uh, I will ask God to help me uh, manifest a more loving lifestyle, life, you know, more loving demeanor of where I can take what hurt me but still not be rough around the edges while I'm trying to help other people. That's the most important thing. I got to go my... Uh, my uh, medic alert thing just went off. It's saying, Will, you must take your medicine to survive. Keep me in prayer. I will keep you in prayer. Fam, when you all ask me for prayer, I am. I can look you right in the eye and tell you that I do pray for you when you ask me for prayer. But right now, I'm still in the a chastisement phase of this where I'm asking God, is there a path? Is there a way? Is there a path back after this transgression that I stumbled into, Lord, of possibly hurting other people or thwarting the gospel of Jesus Christ through my arrogance and ignorance? So that's where I'm at. Like I said, Proverbs says it's a fearful thing. It's, it's fearful to fall into the hands of a living God. And for you people that mock, just remember, if you mock and you're a saved person, you're going to get chastised. If you mock and you're unsaved, <coughs> you're going to have eternity to wish that you hadn't said those foolish words and done those foolish deeds and actions. So it makes me so sad 
makes me so sad that I'm talking about eternal soul salvation. And some of you just come up with these comments that, that prove you're not listening to what I'm saying. You're not taking it seriously. But if you miss the, if you miss the rapture and you get stuck in the tribulation, you will be on your hands and your knees begging God the next day to forgive you when it's too late. And if you, if you uh, take the mark because it's convenient and easy and everybody else is doing it, you will spend eternity alone falling in fire, repenting of your foolishness of not asking God to save you during this time of grace when it's easy. It's relatively easy to ask God to save you and to repent from your sin. Nobody wants to talk about sin. It's a dirty word, you know. But uh, people soft pedal it. That's why the church is pretty much of no effect. I got to go. You can hear my back, my alarm going off crazy in the background saying, Will, take your heart medicine. Will. <clears throat> so, take care of yourself. Live circumspectly. And remember, to live a circumspect life is going to take all of your will and grace of God and everything. So don't waste time on those play, play game things and, and all that. Help your family. Take the burden off of your family. Help your fam parents around the house. Kick in some dollars for to pay some bills. And you will see your respect in your place in the family rise up to where if you do enough out of the love for your parents, you will be uh you will be so necessary to your family that uh you'll be so necessary that your family's not going to have time to beef at you. My, uh, do you remember that, uh, do you remember that crappy cartoon Ultraman and his light would blink when he's down to the last few seconds of charging his battery? That's what it's telling me, so I gotta go. Love y'all. Pops out.